Um, so one, two of the kinds of pr intensive practices that we do in Zen Buddhism, one is called Sashin. Sashin is a Japanese word again. And uh, it's a retreat, and sometimes they're three days, sometimes they're one day, sometimes they're seven days, sometimes they're five days. And in uh, and sometimes they're 90 days, and the 90-day retreat is called Kilche in Korean, Kilche. And Kilche means tight Dharma, and Dharma means truth. So Kilche means a time where you're getting you're, the discipline is very strong, and uh, at the end of Kilche, uh, things open up. So it's it's hunkering down, disciplining yourself for 90 days, uh, and and the practice being getting up at 4:30, sitting half hour segments and walking 10 minutes, having interviews with the teacher. Um, there's a little bit of chanting, a little bit of singing. And, uh, and to talk every day. And so I did that in Korea for 90 days. Uh, um, and uh, in, in Asia, uh, people look at retreats as a great gift. So they, they bring food and candy and cakes and things like that and give money to support it. So, so it's a time of, uh, I mean, maybe a time of, like, if, if you're cooking cabbage, you might put it in a pressure cooker to soften it. And, and so the, the intensive retreats are, are, that's one aspect. Another aspect is uh, it's a time of community. And things are so regulated and so ordered that you don't have to think. You know, that people, that your food is ready, it's simple, it's at a certain time. We have a ritual of eating that makes the eating it together kind of thing. There's no talking. It's, it's typically in silence, although we're not really good at that. But at least in, at the formal times, there's no talking. And, and so it's, a, it, it's a, a time just to organize things in a way that one can really look deeply into one's heart and or to or one can freely sit in the presence of God without distraction, without confusion or, or consideration. And it's also a time of, of meeting, of meeting friends uh, who have the same intention or, or direction, you know, where the uh, community, uh, um, in uh, Sanskrit the word is Sangha, uh, in uh, congregation might be another way, although it's it's uh, uh, greater than just a, a gathering for ritual. It's more a gathering for uh, deepening one's uh, uh, I, I, I don't mean to use words that are like a glib words like practice, uh, a time of, uh, I, I would say it's a time of intimacy. Uh, you, you know, that kind of intimacy where you're, you, you know the other. You, you know, even though you've never, you're not talking, you, maybe you've never seen them before, but you know it's heart-to-heart -heart intimacy. I would say that's the, the direction of it. Being a PhD psychotherapist as well as a Zen teacher, you've experienced teaching in an academic environment and counseling in a clinical environment. What is a Dharma talk? And how is it different from an academic lecture? What information is a teacher designed to convey? Okay, so Dharma talk hopefully is mind-to-mind -mind meeting, heart-to-heart -heart meeting. Uh, not a communication of information necessarily, or not something and some of the best Dharma talks, I think, are ones where one comes away going, what did he say? But that there's an experience of meeting, a sense of, of connection. I would say that's uh, the truest intention of a Dharma talk. Um, and, and it's different in that um, if I was uh, lecturing on um, 
history. Uh, I might want you to remember certain dates as important historically. Or if I was lecturing, if I was teaching brain surgery, I'd want you to be able to know the difference between a frontal lobe and a, <laughs> and a uh, uh, limbic system. I mean, just to begin with, anyway. So there are certain facts that come from academic lectures that you would want, you would hope that. And, and there's a certain kind of intellectual samadhi that comes with, you know, hoping that people, you know, sort of a top down from an academic thing where you're talking information. But there's, a, I, I would think, in the purest sense, a hope that what's lectured about trickles down and becomes a felt sense as opposed to just facts that you repeat on the test. Like I always say, like if I was being, if I had to have brain surgery, I would want a brain surgeon who loved cutting. And I would also want a brain surgeon who really loved the brain, you know, and could go and, you know, I wouldn't want a brain surgeon who was able to pass a test or no information. I would want him to, or her to, you know, love being a brain surgeon more than anything. Just having a great time in there cutting and being careful. <laughs> I would be a terrible brain surgeon. <laughs> if you need brain surgery, don't call me. I'm, when I was in, I, I had to do this, um, when I was in high school, we, we had shop. Did, did anybody, yeah, shop. And the first job, first assignment in shop is to build a wooden square for sanding, you know, like a sanding block, and the shop, teacher gave the dimensions exactly and never passed. I couldn't figure out what, you know, I'd give it to him and say, perfect. He'd go, you know, he'd measure it, you know, and I'd be, it's just my, my uh, uh, suggest you go somewhere else for brain surgery. <laughs> or building a bird cage, a bird thing. What information is a Taisho designed to convey? You know, I, I would say that the single most important thing I would hope for in a Taisho is that we are one, that we are not separate. That would be my hope. Sanzen. Sanzen is a Japanese word again, it means that during retreats, people come for an interview, and oftentimes they're about koans, but not only. And um, how is it? In, in Sanzen or, or in, in Zen interviews, your hope is not that the person gets better. Your, your hope is that the person gets the same. So when they come in, you're, you're not like looking for their pathology and hoping for them to overcome their pathology, you're, I, um, and there's a meeting in that, in between the two in some ways, but you're hoping for, um, again, this meeting of intimacy and hoping that, um, I think there are two levels. One is hope that the meeting in, in the interview is of benefit, and, and the benefit has two levels. One, uh, in terms of their life, and uh, the other is in terms of the world. You know, that one hopes that in the exchange, in the meeting, that the world is benefited in some way. That, that the intimacy of exchange that you carry out, one carries out, uh, actually is a benefit, uh, you know, isn't just, it's, uh, it's vague and uh, difficult to pin down. But that the spirit is that one touch something greater than one's own self-interest. And I think that's hard in psychotherapy because people come in pain and have a lot of self-interest. And so this is a little different in that sense. You know, you want to say, okay, get over your self-interest, let's do something better, or wider. Or... 
different, maybe not better. What is koan, and how do you use koan to work with students? What does it mean to pass a koan? So as I said, koan means public case. And um, there, there are three kinds of koans. There's huadu, uh, huadu, huadu uh, means word, head. And so those koans are like, what am I? Who am I? What is God? What is Buddha? Um, and the general koans that are function koans where you look at the koan and what appears is what what is the correct situation. And then the third kind of koans are what's called nanto koans or, or really difficult, difficult to see through koans. Um, but we could, we could do a little bit of koan. It was signed in Sanzen. Although I don't think that way these days, I, I think I, you know I think koan. When I when I was training with Zen Master Sung San, we would do prostration bows, and, and you know those are all the way down to the floor. You touch your head to the floor, and I did a lot of prostration bows in, in my training. And one of the requirements in meeting the Zen Master is that you do a prostration bow. In the West, this is really really difficult. People don't like to prostrate to each other and there's a whole and they don't like to you know there's a whole kind of hierarchical and false god kind of thing and so i think that koan is a 21st century western prostration that to take up koan is a really willingness to enter into not knowing which is what pros that's the truth of prostration you know that not me, but thee, you know, uh, but we're not trained that way. So I, I think taking up koan, the, the willingness to, to, to be confused, to not know, to not understand, uh, is a kind of supplication or uh, certainly it's a giving away of, of the ego if, if, you're, if you do it, really do it, because they're not solvable by ego they're not you can't see through ego you know i think like if a child were were falling like if you were walking along and there was a cliff and the child started to fall over the cliff what would you do grab a man like that but you wouldn't you couldn't say grab them because what you would do would be before grab Right? If, because if you say grab them, they're gone. You would grab them. And you would grab them because that's your job in that moment. You wouldn't grab them because they were your dear niece or nephew or child or, you know, I mean, that might play into it, but you wouldn't make that, oh, well, you know, I'm not that close. <laughs> I would let them go, right? You grab. Uh, and, and you wouldn't even go, oh, I'm going to be perceived as a wonderful person for having saved this. And maybe later you think that or hope that or something. But in that moment, you do what's necessary and you save a life. And it's not even your business. And that's gone. And my teacher always said correct function, that Cohen always teaches correct function moment by moment by moment, what's, what's correct? Just now, just now, just now, just now. So, um, what does it mean to pass a koan? I don't think anybody ever passes a koan. Um, there, there are schools of koan study that have particular uh, curriculum and uh, criteria. I, I don't think this is, I mean, I, what I'm saying is a bit revolutionary. Not a lot, but a little bit. I don't think there can be a curriculum in koan work. I don't, I mean, how could I know an answer that you don't? You know, that's, it's, it becomes a mind game. So I think, I think koan is, um, I, 
Kuan is meeting, you know, some meeting in, in doubt. And something appears that's encouraging, and, and we'll, we'll, work, we'll look at it in just a minute. And there, there are things that in, encourage the dialogue, but all koans are dialogues. So in the first koan that is, goes like this. A monk asked Joju, and Joju was a very famous Zen master of his day, Chinese, excuse me, a Chinese Zen master in his day, and the monk said to Joju, uh, does a dog have Buddha nature? And in China, when I went to China, China is really rough in this regard. They are, they, their perspective of dogs is like our perspective of pig. Uh, and we're both equally wrong. That you know, Dogs are quite bright and loving, and so are pigs. Uh, pig, the pigs I've known are very bright. And, uh, and if you go to China, you, there are dogs in the, like you go in these back alleys in the big cities and they sell dogs for, to eat. And so maybe this monk had had some experience, some opening, oh, trees are Buddha, sky is Buddha, or God, you, you know, or is the absolute, is the mystical body of, and, and then he, he said, but what about dogs? You know, the mind appears, that what, the mind of measure can't know God, you know this Hindi saying that, uh, where there is measure, uh, God can't abide. Um, and so, uh, so all of a sudden, the mind of measure comes up. Well, dogs, you know, how could a dog have, uh, be sacred? And Joju said, Moo. That's his response, was Moo. And translated, Moo means nothing or no. And Cognitively or intellectually, mu means it's the wrong question. But none of those really see through the, and that's all we can say, you know, he's made a mistake. But none of those really see through the koan, you know, really touch the heart of the koan. And so what, what, how could you, how could one find the heart of this koan? Who would be, like, what did Jojo mean when he said, Mo? What does Mo mean? Mo is a cow mate. No, he's a cow mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's a different Mo. I think that's M O O. This is M U. <laughs> But it is kind of the noise that cow makes. Well, to answer it, you're asking a question? Sure. Well, my answer would be that uh, perhaps another line of reasoning, or if the answer is you've asked the wrong question, then another line of reasoning might be more productive than getting in the philosophical bent of this, your oncology and epistemology, that would be the way to look at that difference. Where you start makes a difference between where you end your analysis. Mm -hmm. The things that you look at as important are determined with your outcome, the way you think through processes or questions. Mm -hmm. The answer to that may be move. So, suppose you were to to take away your doubt or your your. Um, the tentativeness of it, what would you say? I mean, to go with your answer, you had a, but take away the tentativeness, what would you say? I, I would answer that by another question. No, 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 no don't, don't jump beyond that. Go back to what you, your answer. The answer might be... If I take away the doubt, if I look at my own... Question. Wait, no, 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 go slow. You said, exactly you said, the answer might be... Move. Right. So if you take away the doubt part, what do you have? What's left? The answer is? The answer is what? Move. Okay, so if you take away the, the stem of it and just manifest what's left. Move. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So moves, 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 moves. 
I could it be anything else? It doesn't mean anything beyond itself. Go ahead. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Okay. Those of us who may come from the Christian tradition, <laughs> we have a dualistic thought process. Exists even Not only the Christian tradition. <laughs> Well, what, what's the take I don't know if I agree with that, but go ahead. What's the takeaway from Zen that we all might be able to learn to transcend? Okay, so was it in Mark where uh, Jesus said, I am the gate, there's no way to the Father but through me? Perfect koan. I am the gate, there's no way through the Father, to the Father but through me. What did he mean? Jesus is the way to the Father. Okay. He said, I'm the gate. I am the gate. I am the gate. Well, if he is the gate, you have to go through it. Uh huh. What do you go through? Well, somehow, maybe the life of Jesus, or knowing how to act as. as An act of Jesus. Christ. You have to enact the Christ in your heart. I am the gate. There is no way to the Father but through the very heart of Christ. Yeah. And what is the heart of Christ? Love. Hmm? Love. Right. Compassion. But that's a term, right? That's the name of it. But what's the activity of it? Reaching out to others to 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 love yourself and to love others. Mm -hmm. And that's the explanation of it. But what's the actuality of it? You know, the walking next to the child who's about to fall. What's the grabbing of the child? I think that's what the call. Say again. You have to live it in the moment. And how do you do that? Just now, because this is the only moment we got. But but just now. You don't think about it, you just do it. You are it. Okay, but that's the explanation. Huh? But just now, how do you do it? Hmm? Let yourself be carried away. Don't let yourself be carried away. Uh, let, you, <laughs> let yourself be carried let away. Let yourself be carried away into that type of being. Into the bliss of being together. And and so my, one might express, which, which is what we're doing, so one might express it like this. Oh, thank you for your question. Or I'm listening, you're talking, or I'm talking, you're listening. Could there be in this moment anything more sacred than that? I am the gate. There is no way to the Father but through me. Well, it's going to involve your heart. Pretty, pretty sure of that. So that's that's the Christian, Christian poem. All I think the um, there's a book called uh, uh, Zen and uh, the Gospels. I think. Uh, but, but it, they're all koans. You know, my, when I was growing up, my favorite gospel is, you know, very common, is the uh, 23rd Psalm, you know, uh, Lord is my shepherd, I shall know what. Uh, and so, what is, you know, that's Buddhism. One of the first uh, noble truth was wanting causes suffering. Or second noble truth. First noble truth is there's suffering. Second noble truth is wanting causes suffering. Third noble truth is when wanting quiets, suffering diminishes. And the fourth noble truth is that if you live 
according to Christ's teaching, love thy neighbor as thyself. Or, um, that you are wanting quiets and so suffering quiets. So, you know, it's the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. That's the, I am the gate. There's no way to the Father, but through me. And, and alive in each moment of our life. And with each breath, you were saying being. And, and, uh, and being is breathing. And uh, what is the spiritus, you know, this, you know, the very spirit of God lives in breath. How, how do you transition from listening, like analyzing, figuring out, or thinking about what somebody said, trying to figure out their motive, versus listening with your whole being? What would it be like if you listened with your whole being? What do you imagine? You, I, I, you would be still inside. It'd be quiet. There'd be some quiet to it. Would yeah. be alert. Yeah. How would the other person feel? Loved. And and how would they know that they were loved? How do you know when you're loved? Doesn't take much. <laughs> They want to be listened to. Sure. And when you listen, when you really listen to them, no matter what the value of nonsense, you, you can turn their chatter. But when you really listen to them, they love it. But I think we're all like children. Hmm. Aren't we? Essentially, and ultimately, we are. Yeah, may we all find that and never lose it, that innocence. I, I feel, when I feel listened to, uh, the experience is I'm not judged. I, I'm accepted in a moment for who I am. Um, the other hasn't fixated me with some opinion or assumption about me. Um, and, and my hope in wanting to be that in the world is that the practices that I do remind me that that's my original, that I am the gate. When I am gone. Do, do you hear that? Yes. Okay. And, and I'm sorry for, uh, I, mm. should have, I should have been in the moment and listened to you. <laughs> Something was jumping ahead and sure. I apologize for that. Because I want to be that. I want to be that. But I was thinking about... But you're being, for the whole yeah. group, a... Uh, wonder, the wonderer. You're the voice of wonder for the whole group. So that's a that's a fine thing. But I, I was I was thinking of an acting technique. It's called the Meissner technique, where you listen and repeat. And you cannot act, you cannot anticipate, and you cannot pretend. And it sounds very Zen-like, but it was created by this acting teacher named Samuel Meissner. Mm -hmm. And I never quite got it. <clears throat> I never quite got it. And I always wanted to get it. <laughs> what, would, what would it have been like if you got it? <laughs> How would you know? It would just... I, everything has something tagged to it. Every thought has a tag to it. So every response, it always seemed like there would be some sort of tag. And that's how I'm trained in academic thinking. It would be like a reference or a tag. And 
I'd like to be without the references of the tab for a little bit. Okay, so you have an ideal state that, that uh, you imagine mm -hmm. that you're frustrated because you haven't achieved it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Because there is no pure state. Because that's what we say. It, you know, it's the Christ in the heart, not, not my heart. That the eye in the I am the gate is not the small eye. And the small eye has all kinds of ideas about what would be the perfect listener. And my guess is that people around you would see you as the perfect listener if you were just trying and would be tremendously forgiving for all your associative thoughts as long as you were trying. That's, that's my guess. It's, all we can do is try. Yeah. yeah. Right. And remember, I think there's a remembering. Remember. Yeah. That's what... Um, Arjuna said at the end of the Gita, now I remember. Smirtir Lakda. Sanskrit. Say it again. Smirtir Lakda. Smirtirya. Smirtir Lakda. Smirtir Lakda. Lakda. Now I remember. Yeah, I like it better in Sanskrit, but uh, I can't say it. <laughs> when practice. Next time we meet, I'll be able to say it really good. Smirtir is related to smart. Smirtis are related to being smart. Yeah. What's labda? Labda is to put together. Put together smartness. Put together smartness. Okay. <laughs> Wisdom. Let, let me read something, a, a koan that we've been looking at together. It's, it's a little complicated, so if, if it feels complicated, that's okay. Um, and it speaks to some of what we're saying. Because you, you, what you said was, I, I have this uh, thing I'm looking at both as a psychologist and a spiritual teacher, is uh, uh, what is the jewel in the deficit? You know, we all, in the default, so we all have def default positions, like we, you know, maybe anger is a default when we get triggered, or maybe um, uh, self-pity is a default, or uh, there was a woman who I was working with, and she said, I don't have a default. <laughs> And I said, uh, you do, I know you have a default. And she said, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, so her default was at the end of every sentence, she laughed. And I said, at the end of every sentence, you giggle. And she said, no, I don't. <laughs> and then she was embarrassed, she, ashamed. And, and I didn't mean to shame her in any way. And I said, but let's look. Let's look at what the default is. Well, the, the jewel in the default. You know, and so we were in another room and people said, oh, she's nervous and she's anxious and blah, 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 stage fright and all that. And all these. And I said, no, I, you know, I think the jewel is her compassionate heart. She's basically saying, I'm not going to kill you. You know, that's most in language, right? In, in Korean, they always go, blah, 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 hanya. And there, nobody knows what those mean except that they're basically, it's okay. You know, everything's safe here. I'm not gonna kill you. So, is this what, just an hour? Well, I think we're fine. I mean, we'll probably end everything around six. So we're at 5.30 right now, but we've been interacting, yeah. okay. you know, so we're, we're good. Okay, good. So, um, so we had so there's a jewel in every default, right? In every uh, uh, situation that, in every automatic response that we have, even though it serves history of our, the history of our life, within it there's a jewel. And her, the jewel in, in for her, not the analysis or the pathologizing of it, was some communication that it's okay, everything is okay. And once you own the jewel, the uh, the um, default transforms. Once the jewel is owned, the default transforms. Okay. 
Okay, so let me read this koan. It's called um, How You Obtain Vines, such as a book of koans, basically. And uh, these koans are dialogues. And so this is a dialogue between um, the monk Hao Yu and a teacher Chang Sha. So uh, Hao Yu asked Chang Sha, an ancient worthy once said, with awakening, karmic obstructions are originally empty. Without awakening, past debts must be paid. When, why then did Venerable Arya Shima and the Second Patriarch have to pay their debts? And Chingsha answered, Venerable Monk, you don't understand what originally empty means. And how you asked, what is original emptiness? And the teacher said, karmic obstruction itself. And the, how, how you says, what is karmic obstruction? And the teacher says, original emptiness itself. So when how you had nothing to say, Chang Sha instructed him with this verse, provisional existence is not existence. Provisional extinction is not null. In their true sense, nirvana and repaying debts are of one nature and differ not at all. So it's a little difficult, a little complicated. But basically what he's saying is, you know, these guys are enlightened, clear people, and both of them were murdered later in their lives. Uh, one, the uh, Ashima was murdered by a king. Uh, there was apparently a, um, a robbery, and the robbers dressed up like Buddhist monks, and the robbery was stopped, but the king still believed that the it was Buddhist monks who attempted it, so he had, so he personally executed Ashima. And the legend is that milk came from Ashima's throat when he cut his head off, and that the king's arm fell off, and later he died. So I don't, you know, those are teaching legends. And Hui Ko was uh, teaching, and he, uh, he's the second, he's the first Zen teacher in. China. Bodhidharma came to China from India, and Hui Ko is the first Chinese teacher. And it said that after some time, he went off and taught uh, in obscure areas, and was uh, eventually uh, murdered. And so this guy saying, you know, well, if if you awaken, if you see through, haven't your karmic debts been been paid. I mean, why should he? Why should these guys be killed? Should they be um, free from the law of cause and effect? Shouldn't they be free from uh, suffering or mistreatment or violence? It's our hope, right? I, I'd like to get enlightened in a way so that no longer anything bad happens to me. And yet I. I'm growing old and losing my eyesight and losing my hearing and my back hurts and which is life itself and and so the koan is saying this very life is the awakened life when good happens it's the awakening of good and when bad happens it's great sadness And that this is our life. And there isn't some idea of a perfect listener that you're failing to be, or a perfect being, but only how we act moment by moment. And, and how we receive this life uh, as our life with a kind of uh, humility and uh, one of the defaults that I've been working with is shame. That uh, and, and you were talking about Christianity and Christian. You know, I was raised in a shame, the shame culture. But what's the intention? What's the jewel within shame? If if we took up shame as a koan, what what would? What's the jewel? What could it be? You've fallen short. 
short of who you are. Well, that's, but, that's a cause of shame. Yes, but <clears throat> then you know that there is something greater than that act itself, which is you. Oh, I like that. I like that. That, that, that somehow shame brightens that there is something greater than the fallibility of my own actions. Oh, I like that a lot. Sweet. For, for me, shame, the jewel in shame, is humility. That, that if, you know, if one takes up shame without guilt, it's, it's humbling. You're, you know, it, maybe it's getting at what you're saying. You know, I am not perfect. Uh, just doing my best. A sense of... Uh, 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 it's when the ego is let go of in shame. You know, the shame has a lot of ego still in it. So when that's let go of, there's a kind of humility. It's an, it, I've always had trouble with humility because humility it, it means uh, sort of... It all depends on what your definition of humility is. Well, what is it? He who exalts himself shall be humble. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. Um, I like to think of it in its greatest sense as just being a, just being empty, just being an empty container, humbleness, rather than saying, now I've got to feel bad for all the things I've done wrong and feel ashamed of it. You know, sometimes people think that is humbleness. You know, before you do an action, well, don't, don't be proud because you've done X, Y, and Z. And uh, you shouldn't toot your horn very well because uh, you don't you don't have any right to. But it's to be neither of those somehow, I think. You can be proud of your humbleness, which a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. What's your definition of humbleness? I was looking at that, looking at that uh, you know, uh, inspired by your question uh, or your discourse. I, I think for me, humility is the realization that at my best, I'm not good enough. honest, to be authentic, to be real, mm -hmm. to to recognize what is, to be with what is, mm -hmm. not be greater than I am, not be less than I am, true, honest, real. I like that. And to know what that is. Say, say something. To know, to know who I am, <laughs> to know my gifts and my talents and my faults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at my best, I'm not good enough. <laughs> well, I mean that I'm, I, well, that's one well, half of it. That's one half of it, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and at my best, I'm all of it. Okay, yeah, yeah okay, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And, and maybe humility is for me to, to hear you say that. <laughs> And to be real, to be honest, to be authentic is, I'm not whole unto myself. It takes all of us, and we're yes. not separate. We yeah. are one. Yeah, exactly. At my best, I'm not good enough. Without you, mm -hmm. I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's in a practical sense. If I were sitting up here talking, and I didn't have your friendship in it, it would, wouldn't happen. I'd be, I couldn't, my hope would be to meet. You. And if there's no one there to me, then yeah, at my best, I'm not good enough. 
that you know, you know, what some they say takes a village to raise a child and all of those things. And even it was my my keenest strongest intention to do my best, I still make mistakes. And and there and so then there's the possibility of compassion not only for others, but for myself. At my best I'm not good enough. By myself. By myself. Which you said, because yeah. of the earth. Because without this earth, we're gone. Without gravity, we're not hit we're not sitting here. You know, gravity is a great friend, and nobody knows what's what is gravity. Is it? You're, is there anybody in science here? No. So I can say whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody knows what gravity is. You know, and by most calculations, there's too much of it, so it must be leaking off somewhere. Whatever somewhere is. Special gravity storehouse. People don't know. Do that, that's one challenge that we have as teachers: is not everyone will hear that statement the same way. But at my best, I'm not good enough. Right. Not every. And my experience with students: one of the key things that I want them to be more of is is to have more self-esteem. They, they beat themselves up so much. Uh, one of the words they like to use the most is can't. And so I want to break that habit, the can't have habit. And, and while well, at their best they're not good enough, they'll take that in a different way than, than we will take that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 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 you're, so out of this dialogue that we're having, mm -hmm. it's not me. Did you leave your cell phone on? No, I don't think it's mine. You can't to give a talk with your It's cell your phone. cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> My best, I'm not good enough. <laughs> okay, so, so what I'm hearing you say is uh, uh, there's some hope that uh, uh, your students thinking about themselves is not going to interfere with their true ability. I want them to see the light in themselves rather than the, all the faults, which they can clearly see. Mm -hmm. And they don't seem to see the, the light as much. They don't seem to see the, the love and compassion and, the, and their, their smartness, their, their brilliance. They, don't, they won't acknowledge that. It's almost wrong to acknowledge that, mm -hmm. or to be the smart one. I mean, I, I've seen smart students who I know knows will know an answer, but will not answer because they're surrounded. They, they don't want to be shown as the smarty, yeah. the smarty pants. Yeah. Okay. So what I would say is, at my best, I am not good enough, and at your best, you're perfect. The problem that I have with that, I'm at my best, I'm not good enough, is that it seems like when you say that, there is no further avenue to go. I cannot improve. Because I, if I'm at my best, I, I, I don't believe that people don't improve. I think we all improve as days go by. Mm -hmm. And so. That's why I would have a problem with that. My best. Maybe we can change it too. Wait, 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 let's go so. So, so if I say to you, at my best, I'm good enough, where can I improve? The, so, at, at my best today, maybe I'm good enough because that's all I can do today. But what happens tomorrow? So is my I, best tomorrow going to be the same as it is today? Yes. So, so when I hear that, at my best I'm not good enough, I see that there is no room for growth. Uh -huh. So you feel trapped by it. Yeah, I, I see it as that the top is wide open, that I'm not finished. Yeah, but that's okay. 
I, your your statement's not a negative statement. It's a positive statement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I am not, in my best, I'm not good enough, but I'm getting better and better. No. <laughs> no, no. At my well, best. you don't want to get better and better? No. Uh, Are you so as you're, good you're, as you're, you're going to <laughs> You can't be better than you are. I, you don't think you can be better than you are. And it's still not good enough. Do you see the pair? I mean, that just be you. But you see, you don't. But people don't realize themselves their full potential. Really? Yeah, I think so. I think people realize their absolute full potential all the time. I think a lot of people do, but not everybody. I think everyone does. Really? Yeah. How is that? Because you explain that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. At my best, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. At your best, you're perfect. All we have is this moment. So if we're fully present in the moment, is there getting better? Not for this moment, but for the next moment. <laughs> for the next moment. <laughs> so that tomorrow might be a little kinder. Right, of course. And that, that's what I mean by my best, I'm not good enough. That tomorrow I'll be more kind and more generous and less self-involved. So an invitation to keep doing your best? An invitation, at my best, I'm not good enough, is an invitation to be, uh, to blossom. I, you know, to to come to full realization in some way. But it's marvelous because it, it's a con. At my best, I'm not good enough. And it triggers all kinds of... And But also it's triggered this wonderful dialogue about it. I, I mean, is it true? At my best, I'm not good enough? At my best, I am what I am. It's like a sunset or a sunrise. Hmm? The one, it's like a sunset or a sunrise. Yeah. The one you're looking at is the most beautiful. Yeah. There's going to be another one tomorrow. And it'll be the most beautiful one you're looking at. Maybe. maybe but, but, and what about the friend that you're talking with? The only friend you have. Hmm? At, at that moment, at that, it's, it, uh, Matt, Matt and I and a few others have had discussions like this, and in the beginning, my head hurt. But then I learned that I kept trying to figure it out, right. rather than just being in that discussion, taking from that discussion what I could at that time, and then build, you know, on, on further discussions, further moments. Uh, it, it, it's not something that's all of a sudden you get it. You always had it. Nor is it something that's fixed. And, and I think, um, what, um, what's, uh, what's your name here? On, what, what's your name? My name? Yeah. My name is Regina. Sister Regina? Sister Regina. Sister Regina. Okay. So what S Sister Regina is saying is that that being, that, that the, that, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't mean to speak for you, but that the root of being is getting better, being, being, blossoming. Uh, and, and without the root and the stem, there's no blossom. And we certainly love the blossom. You know, when, I mean, the blossoming is the vital fruit of. And do we love the flower that has the brown petal less than the perfect blossom?
And so I'm, I'm saying that at my best, I'm a brown petal blossom. <laughs> There's another another side of it too. Is that at my best, I'm not good enough because there's an I involved. That very movement has a corruption implicit in it. So that it could, there could be a shift from at my best, at our best, we are good enough. And, and then there's meeting and friendship and kindness and tolerance and all of those wonderful things. Where the, where the eye arises, value appears at my best. I. I'm not good enough. It's it's the it's the corollary to I am the gate. There's no way to the Father but through me. Yeah. This is just a personal question. Sure. When, when I was in college, I read Alvin Watts, mm -hmm. and being having your background, what he was saying is he didn't necessarily. He thought that Zen might be a better way. Psychotherapy than, than religion. Yeah. <laughs> the question I had is, would you agree with that? Having practices and been, been there, done that. Yeah, you missed the first part when I said that that was the first book I read. Oh, I did miss it. Yeah, Psychotherapy East and West. Um, you, you know, I think it takes a real lot for people to to get over the trauma of their childhood. Um, it, it, Psychotherapy, having a relationship, a, a rehabilitative relationship is, is helpful, can be helpful, but it takes a tremendous amount of, of time and effort and, and a gorgeous people in your life. Um, listeners, it, uh, you know, people who are willing to just be present for you. Um, so I don't know a better way. No. I, you know, I know that I know that uh, the sister who was who is gone, but she said uh, love. You know that that's fundamentally that's all we have to offer. Uh, so whether it's in the context of sitting in a chair in an office where somebody pays you an exorbitant amount of money or sitting in the, or me, or sitting on the bus, you know, or sitting here talking together. Can I ask you one question? You mentioned the traumas that people have in their childhood. Uh, <clears throat> I've been part of a meditation group, a uh, different kind of meditation in years uh, since 1975. And when we get together for longer meditations uh, over the years, for weeks, uh, as you have talked about, uh, what would occur sometimes with people is something with, that would, we would call purification, unstressing, normalization, um, maybe unraveling the knots of some trauma that happened before. That would happen. Uh, and some people wonder about why does this happen, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the intensity of it happening. And there's a lot of discussion in my groups that I, I know about that. But I'm just curious about your practice. Does that occur in your practice uh, to a greater or lesser degree? Okay, I, I, I'll talk to that for a minute. From my understanding, not the absolute and don't speak, mm -hmm. but only from my experience. <clears throat> I think there are practices you can do that bring about changes in your state, emotional state, and uh, practices you can do both with other people and alone that, 
that give you some catharsis or freedom from bound energy in some way. It's my experience that a lot of those practices will, will create a shift in state and then maybe there's a slight movement, but that, that the state is gone. That well-being, you know, like, a, like in the encounter groups in the 60s. You come away feeling wonderful and loving the world, and, uh, or religious conversion can be that way. I saw a woman years ago in therapy who was, had a religious conversion experience, and, and was, she was Baptist and did all the things according to that. And, and she came in and her eyes were bright and shiny and she was glowing. And, and I said, well, you don't need to come anymore. And she said, well, let me come a couple more times. And in a few weeks, that conversion experience had diminished and she was depressed again. So energies move and there are techniques and things you can do to move energy. And then there's something else. that doesn't move, that isn't coming and going. And, and I don't think you can access it, access it. I think you, I think you, you can have faith, you can, you, you know, I think it's a, a blessing or a, in, in Judaism, it's a mitzvah or a, or a uh, you know a grace of some kind. Uh, so uh, yeah, you know, not not something I can do to bring it about. It's yeah. Thank you. Gotta go. Thanks. Thanks for your questions. Complete? Finished? Any one more question? Go ahead. What's your name? Mary Oso. Sister Mary? Okay. Um, do you call yourself Christian or Buddhist? Or, and then, well, answer that first. Then I have another question. Okay. I, I usually call myself Tegak. <laughs> <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> Tricky. I'm not smart. I'm tricky. Yes, but in, well, in that, you know, is it a blend? Um, like uh, the Christian, I mean, you quoted Christian mm -hmm. truth. Sure. So how does the, how does that? Uh, and maybe I should say the reason why I'm asking mm -hmm. that is because in my own, I'm here today because I want to be enriched by the Zen mm -hmm. experience. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And and and. I can see there's a, you know, a lot of correlation. Oh yeah, of course, uh, sure. But I was just wondering, you who've experienced both, who've seen it, how do, how do you how do you blend it, or does it blend, or is there just one way for you? Oh no, no, no. As I said, we went to Gethsemane for ten years, and, and uh, yeah. But you were teaching your way, so that doesn't mean that you. Oh, meeting them, no, no, more meeting them, meeting, meeting, it would, be, it would be hard to impose a doctrine on the monks of Gethsemane, you know, the pretty hardcore Christians. Um, but meeting in that, yeah, I, I think truth, you know, there's only one truth. It has different names, but fundamentally there's only one aliveness, one intimacy, one... And, and I think, and in Buddhism, you know, there are lots of practices and teachings and teachers that take you far away from that, as in Christianity. You know, the violence of misuse of, of power and doctrine and all of that. Uh, okay. What is the heart of the Zen method? Thank you for your question. <laughs> Like you, you it. Okay, just here, just now, just this. What are you doing just now, right now? That's the heart of it. So really, mindfulness of the moment. Uh, I struggle with that word mindfulness, but 
Yeah. Be present. Pure internal presence. Doesn't arise, doesn't cease, can't be brought about. Each moment is sacred and complete in and of itself. I mean, that's a great basis for everything in life. It's been my experience. <laughs> when I can remember it. <laughs> yes. 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 I really appreciate your thoughts. Oh, yeah. It, it's been wonderful to, to, to hang out with you. Really lovely. Makes me long for the days of Gethsemane. <laughs> All my sister friends. Yes. So the, the two that you mentioned, mm -hmm. Marilyn and Jim, yeah. I see them often. Tell we them, see them often. send them my love. I will. Yeah, they come yeah. every day for mass. Oh, do they? Wonderful. Oh, oh that, so that's how they resolved it. Good, 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 good. Yeah, send them my love. And, and, uh, they're gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.